Um, and with that, I would like then to turn to introducing our first um, item on this morning's agenda, which will be a, a keynote conversation um, involving uh, some of the luminaries in broadband, including your own Senator Angus King. So let me introduce our three uh, panelists. We'll get them up here and we'll get going. Um, first, as I mentioned, we're very privileged to have Senator Angus King here today. I think those of you from Maine know he's been your senator since uh, January of 2013, and before that he served two terms as governor of Maine. And in both of these positions, he's been an absolute champion for expanding broadband um, in this state and in rural America um, in all of our 50 states. Uh, I, I have followed his many activities in this space. Uh, and most recently, he introduced the Digital Learning Equity Act of 2015, which aims to narrow the digital divide by supporting innovative ways to ensure that students stay connected both inside and outside the classroom. He's been involved in health information technology. He's been an uh, active uh, participant and commenter on activities in the administration, including the Broadband Opportunities Council work uh, uh, that I'll be talking more about at lunchtime and which you'll hearing about uh, uh, along the day. So uh, we're very uh, happy to to have him here. I will mention he's a graduate of Dartmouth College and the University of Virginia School of Law, but now lives in Brunswick, Maine. Um, so I'm not sure what your connection is with Bowdoin up there, but uh, a wonderful town. Um, our second panelist from the White House is David Edelman. He's special assistant to the president for economic and technology policy. Uh, works both at the National Economic Council and at the Office of Science and Technology Policy, but he only gets paid one salary. Um, but in that role, he leads policy development and coordination on issues relating to the digital economy, including broadband competition and access, high-tech intellectual property, online privacy, technology trade, and internet governance. Uh, prior to his time at the White House, he served as a policy advisor in the State Department's office of Cyber Affairs, where he was responsible for developing U.S. diplomatic strategy and international legal doctrine on cyber issues. Um, he holds a B.A. from Yale and both a master's and a doctorate uh, in international relations from Oxford University. Um, and most pertinent to this audience, he's been involved in broadband activities as long as he's been at the White House and uh, most notably was the architect of the president's $10 billion Connect Ed initiative, uh, and he's currently leading its implementation. Our, our moderator for this discussion, who probably ought to be a panelist herself, is Susan Crawford, a professor at Harvard Law School and a co-director at the Berkman Center there at Harvard. Uh, previously, she served as President Obama's special assistant for science, technology, and innovation policy, um, where she uh, was one of the principal architects of the Recovery Act Broadband Grant Program. Um, and in addition to helping set up that program, she served as a very able mediator between NTIA and the U.S. Department of Agriculture because uh, you can't have anything in government without a little competition, and we found ourselves uh, uh, competing with each other a little bit in terms of uh, attracting grants and awarding grants, and uh, many times we had to call Susan in to, uh, um, to help out in that regard. But it was all for good. It was all to get the money out as fast as we could and to get projects built as fast as we could. Um, uh, so as long as she's been involved with the White House, she's been on, on various lists of fast-rising people in America. So in 2009, Fast Company named her one of the most influential women in technology. In 2013, Time Magazine named her to their Tech 40, uh, the most influential minds in tech. Um, and then most recently, she was named one of Politico's 50 thinkers, doers and visionaries. So Susan received her BA and JD from Yale. Um, so with that, let me bring our three panelists up and we'll get going with our keynote conversation. Thank you. to be on stage with both of you. Uh, you're both examples of tenacious, shining, relaxed 
leaders full of humor and openness. I want to start, Senator, with you. Um, just a year ago, we were together at the launch of the first gigabit network in Maine, in Rockport, Maine. Very exciting day. And you said that day, internet service, in my opinion, is exactly like water. It's exactly like electricity. It's a utility that is necessary in order for our country and our economy to flourish, for opportunity, for choice, for freedom. And since then, the president and the administration seem to have been listening to you. So connect for us the link between high-speed internet access and economic opportunity for people in Maine, in rural areas, in the country as a whole. Well, first I want to say it's appalling that somebody wrote down something that I said. <laughs> uh, I don't know if I've ever had that happen before. Uh, let me start with a, with a quick quote. Uh, time and experience have verified to a demonstration the public utility of internal improvements that the poorest and most thinly populated counties would be greatly benefited by the opening of good roads and in the clearing of navigable streams within their limits is what no person will deny. That was the first political brochure by a 23-year-old candidate for the Illinois legislature in 1832. The candidate was Abraham Lincoln. The first political brochure, the first political statement he talked about was public infrastructure, which is exactly what we're talking about today. And everybody here realizes this. Broadband is exactly like roads and water. By the way, that's why it's a utility. Uh, net neutrality should be a basic principle. Um, but it's the basis of economic development. And, and I think about this in very practical terms. Can you imagine a realtor leading a young couple through a home in a rural area and saying, uh, this is a wonderful home, here's the land, and that's where the, that's where the fence is, and you own out to the stream, but by the way, you can't ever have water in this house. Or you can't ever have broadband. Mm -hmm. And the same thing goes for economics. Particularly in rural areas, broadband is the equalizer. Maine has already always been geographically challenged. You know, we're in the upper right-hand corner of the map. There's nothing above us. Well, when I was a kid, now we know that's called Canada. But, you know. And by the way, I have foreign policy credentials because I can see Canada from Maine. So we want to clarify that. Um, but it's, it's, a, it's a geographic equalizer, and it gives us opportunities, and we're seeing it in Maine. We're seeing, I meet people all the time who live here and work other places. I was at a, a, an opening of a high-tech manufacturing company in Lewiston on Friday that's owned, the investment is by a company in Italy. And the broadband connection between those two, between Lewiston and uh, Castel Grande in Italy is, is essential to that relationship. So it's, it's, it, it couldn't be more straightforward in terms of the the economic value, and, and therefore, we've got to be sure everybody's connected at, uh, at a reasonable rate uh, and at a reasonable cost. And I, we're getting to the point where we're getting the connections. Now we have to talk about, talk about competition and cost. I think that's, that's going to be, in, in some ways, the next frontier. So to follow up on that, uh, David Edelman has been a stalwart visionary for high-speed Internet access leading from the West Wing. And it's been quite a year in telecommunications policy. It suddenly became chic. You know, we were on, we're on the pages where it's central to the national conversation. Bring us up to date, David, how are there are challenges that remain. We're in this Gutenberg moment when we're changing our modes of communication, but it takes a while for Gutenberg moments to take hold. And uh, we're leaving a lot of people behind. Competition isn't what it needs to be. What's the administration doing to move the ball forward? Sure, and thanks for the question. I mean, let me begin by saying that it is a real pleasure to be up here. I don't know how many of you know this, but Susan had a version of my job at the beginning of the administration, and that's when the absolute cream of the crop comes into oh. the administration. The who do you really want doing a job <laughs> is her. And so really, so much of what you heard about Larry talking about today in BTOP, so much of what you're going to hear about this afternoon is really built upon the work that you did. And for those of you who are Maine voters, hate to say this, but talk about leadership. 
on broadband on every single issue, from net neutrality to community broadband and beyond, Senator Angus King has really been at the forefront. So really, thank you for your leadership. It has been a big year. It's been a big several years. I mean, over the course of the last six years, we have seen tremendous progress. And I think it's, it's easy to lose that. I mean, there has been, for instance, $160 billion in public and private investment in broadband in this country during what was the worst economic downturn in a generation. No industries were investing. And yet, this country got it together and invested in broadband, in part because of smart tax policies we put into place and because of the Recovery Act that we put into place. You know, as a result of the public side of it, 175,000 miles of fiber were built and upgraded. That's major progress. You know this because you oversaw a lot of it. Mm -hmm. You know, that's a huge milestone in moving forward the idea of middle mile connectivity. But you're absolutely right. Even though tens of millions more Americans have probably double the internet speed that they had when they start the beginning of this administration and they aren't paying any more, we do not have cause to be satisfied. And the reason for that, you know, is, is pretty clear. I mean, as the president said when he was in Cedar Falls, Iowa, which was sort of a, a focal point for us this year, it was around State of the Union, uh, you know, he put it pretty clearly. Broadband is no longer a luxury, it's a necessity. And that really is the North Star of our policies moving forward. And so we know that we don't have cause to be satisfied when two out of three schools do not have the broadband speeds that they need to deliver personalized learning or even to stream two videos in the same classroom. We know that we can't be satisfied when 51% of Americans in the bottom quintile of income don't have the internet at home. They don't have a way to get online that is reliable. Those are reasons that we know we have a lot more work to do. And so over the course of not just the last year, but the last few years, you know, we've put into motion some major programs designed to fill in those gaps. So we announced the Connect Ed initiative that you've already heard about that set this ambitious goal of connecting 99% of schools within five years to high-speed broadband and wireless. And the public sector, the FCC, came through with $8 billion of funding to, make that, to close that gap. And the private sector came through, too, with $2 billion of technology that is presently in schools, in use in all 50 states. Millions of students are taking advantage of that. That's a major step forward. We announced uh, earlier this summer the Connect Home initiative which is focused on low-income communities, 28 communities coming together to focus on broadband affordability and making sure that the lowest-income Americans have access to Internet at an affordable, lower-than-retail rate and that they're getting the digital literacy and the training that they need to make it meaningful. I think we're going to spend a lot of time today talking about how to make that Internet meaningful. Um, you know, and I think the last initiative that we're going to spend more time this afternoon talking about as well is the Broadband Opportunity Council, which I will be the first to tell you is not the sexiest thing in the world. However, oh, yes, it, is. it could be a sex of Susan <laughs> odd barometer. It is, sir, I think, one of those issues that of all the things we announced in Cedar Falls, one that is going to absolutely have the longest term impact on broadband investment and competition. Because 40% of Americans still only have one provider that they can access for true broadband speeds. One provider, that's a monopoly, that's a problem. And so the Broadband Opportunity Council is focused on empowering everyone around the country, particularly communities, at figuring out how the federal government can, in many cases, use its resources better to better allocate programs that we have on the books to focus on broadband and, where necessary, to get out of the way, to roll back regulation where it's unnecessary or to make smarter use of federal legislation. And I think one of the next steps for the next few months will be what can we do to partner with communities in the Northeast, in Maine, across the country to help them replicate the same ideas that the NTIA and the Agriculture Department brought together from these 25 agencies in the council report. I have a suggestion uh, along the lines that you were talking about, about your report, because it's a wonderful report. It just came out a week ago. If you want to get some broader readership, change the name. <laughs> okay. Fifty Shades of Broadband. <laughs> oh, boy. <laughs> that would make it sexy. Senator King, <laughs> fantastic report. Really, a, a thing of beauty. Um, which of its recommendations resonated with you? They're lowering a lot of barriers. And there might be some secret gems in there that particularly spoke to you. Well, first, I, I think, um, you know, Dr. Johnson's uh, admonition about the dog that walked on its hind legs, the remarkable thing was not that it, it did it well, but that it did it at all. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I think one of the most important things about the report is it's one of the most comprehensive cooperative efforts within the federal government I've ever seen. How many? You had 23 agencies? 25 in total. 25 agencies that really did cooperate. I commend it to you because it's very specific. 
And uh, I'll tell you, this is, this is sort of, I, I guess I think it's sort of simple terms. I like the dig once idea. Right. Yeah. I mean, to have the Department of Transportation say, if you're going to tear up a road, put in conduit so you can later wire it up without having to dig up the road again. I mean, that's, and to, and to have that be a part of federal highway policy, which in turn opens up everything else at a much more economic basis. I mean, that's the kind of thing that I really liked in the report that just is uh, uh, common sense but wouldn't happen other than with this kind of overall thinking. So. Uh, lots of recommendations, and, and of course the FCC wasn't is an independent agency, but there are a lot of hints to the FCC in right. there, yeah. which I suspect Tom Wheeler will, will pay attention to. But uh, uh, those are the kinds of things that I found most striking is the practical things, and just things like requiring HUD to be thinking about the wiring of buildings when they build the buildings, uh, uh, those kinds of uh, practical things because they all deal with the issue of cost. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, uh, you know, the myriad of federal programs, agriculture grants, Department of Justice grants to, to uh, uh, police departments, all of which would be thinking about broadband as part of the solution of whatever the issue is. That's what I found most compelling about the report. And just like a paperback where certain pages become tattered with use and, and reading, uh, just to carry this along, I, I was particularly excited about the new market tax credits element of this, bringing uh, communities from weakness to strength, making it possible to get access to treasury funds for high-speed internet access infrastructure. That's one of my favorites. Do you have any favorite children in this, David? I, you're, you're, you're involved in a lot of I can't pick favorite children because right. they're all aged. Look, I, you know, I think <laughs> you, you, both of you put your finger on the most important takeaway of this, which is this report brought together all these agencies in part because Larry Strickling asked them to come. And when Larry Strickling asked them to come, they show up, 25 agencies. It's kind mm -hmm. of remarkable. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it was a big room. And the message that everyone took from that was broadband is all hands on deck. Mm -hmm. This is no longer just an effort that is going to be housed at the Commerce Department or at the Agriculture Department or in the Science Office of the White House. That broadband is now so core to the delivery of government service and the delivery on federal mission, whether it's from foreign policy and internet freedom, to economic development, to small businesses, to paying your taxes, to getting a job, to improving your skills, to education. Every single federal agency has a role and a stake in getting broadband into the home and into folks' hands. And so, you know, I can't pick a favorite in part because to me, I think the, the big contribution was getting everybody on the same page. And so now our effort moving forward is to keep pushing that momentum and that enthusiasm that they brought to this report into executing it. And Senator, preparing for this interview, I went back and looked at some of your clips recently. And when the Pope came to town in DC, you said, I think that's the first time the golden rule has gotten a standing ovation from Congress. Yeah. That was a great, <laughs> great line. And, and I just want to touch on the bipartisan, deregulatory nature of a, a lot of what's going on, that this is not and should not be a partisan issue. Do you have any thoughts about that? Well, there are lots of things that shouldn't be partisan issues that right. are. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I don't see this. For example, one of the bills that Larry mentioned that I've been working on about uh, sort of deregulation of some, some uh, health uh, internet related issues, I, my co-sponsor is Deb Fisher, a Republican from Nebraska. Uh, and, and I think there are, I, and there's a widespread, let me, let me back up for a sec. The U.S. Senate is essentially a rural body. Mm -hmm. I don't know if people realize that, but I think it's, I haven't done the calculation lately, but something like 18, 18 U.S. Senators out of 100 represent a majority of the citizens of the United States. And it's because New York has two Senators and Maine has two Senators and California has two Senators and Wyoming has two Senators. So the, the thrust of the body is, is, is rural. And so that means that issues like this, which are really relate most directly to rural areas have great resonance in, a, in an institution like the Senate because of its fundamentally rural uh, orientation. Uh, and so I, I, I see an opportunity. Now, unfortunately, net neutrality seems to have taken on a partisan chaos. Mm -hmm. I, I think that, that that's a mistake and, and I hope we can uh, not have that uh, messed with uh, the decision that the FCC made last year. But, um, 
I see a lot of opportunity for bipartisan uh, uh, cooperation. And by the way, I can't, we've all talked about the Recovery Act, the, the stimulus package. Uh, in, here in Maine, uh, it's important to remember that that would not have passed without the votes of Olympia Snow and Susan Collins. Mm -hmm. Literally, they were the deciding votes in the U.S. Senate, and it would not have passed. It took a lot of political courage for them uh, to do that, and uh, we wouldn't have had the three-ring binder or, or any of those other uh, right. benefits of the, of the stimulus package involving uh, broadband with, without that uh, bill. So I have to give credit to my my senior colleague. <laughs> and David Elman, thank you for bringing us back to Cedar Falls, Iowa, which was quite a moment. The president was so loose-limbed, talking about basketball, having a great time. And he said to the people in Cedar Falls who'd built a fiber network, you guys were like the captain in Jaws. You said, you're going to need a bigger boat. You know, they needed more capacity for that place. And I was recently in Somerville Town Hall, where the motto is, municipal freedom, national strength. David, comment on what the administration's doing, particularly for municipalities across the country. Sure, and for those of you who aren't familiar with the Cedar Falls example, I, I would really encourage you to take a second, take a look at the President's remarks, just mm -hmm. Google the town website. I mean, they have really done some remarkable things. Uh, I would also add that if you had told me at the beginning of the administration that we would have sent the President as one of his five pre-State of the Union announcements to lead up to that speech to do something on community broadband, I would have thought you were crazy. So <laughs> that was a really big moment. It was a big moment to highlight what a community can do. I mean, they didn't do this with, you know, federal grant money that suddenly descended from the heavens. Cedar Falls put together a broadband network that delivers speeds at 100 times the national average for a cost for the average citizen of what I pay for a fully loaded cable package. I mean, that is truly remarkable. And they've really mm -hmm. seen dividends paid from yeah. it. I mean, they have attracted new investment. They have kept big companies. They're doing research and development. It's an incredible success story. And, you know, what the president said in Cedar Falls was that he wants to deliver more stories like that around the country. And so, you know, one of the first things that he did was he called on the FCC to ensure that there weren't undue barriers to communities who wanted to have this local choice. That it's not the right answer for everyone, but for communities that want to take the plunge and to do this, to build a community fiber network, they should have the option to do so. There should be nothing unduly getting in the way of that. And so mm -hmm. he called on the FCC to roll back some of the 19 state laws uh, that created this unlevel playing field, and the FCC did it. The FCC actually acted on the one order that was before it to reverse that uh, two of those state laws. So that's been important progress. The NTIA has a major initiative through Broadband USA uh, that is working with a number of communities who want to get their questions answered, who want to know how they can do that because the NTIA has the expertise through BTOP in these sorts of setting up these sorts of programs. And so they're working with communities all over the country. And, you know, I think another big part of it is just continue to get the word out, to continue to explain how communities can empower themselves, that they don't have to settle for the status quo. But I would add that there's one other piece that they have to bear in mind, which is that be just as community broadband solutions aren't always the answer, municipalities have an important role to play here. And that's another part of the Broadband Opportunity Council report that it highlights. I think moving forward in the next several months, we're going to look at ways that we, the federal government, can help put together a sort of playbook, versions of which already, I think, e exist through NTIA resources, but to help cities, municipalities, states understand what are the regulatory barriers that really make the difference in discouraging investment of incumbent ISPs? Because for the majority of Americans, that will be a solution. And so the more that communities can do when there are unnecessary regulatory permitting barriers, the vast majority of which are at the sub-federal level, helping them understand that and to take that action can be a really important complementary way that we can deliver better broadband in communities that are underserved, which are the majority of American communities right now. And Senator King, there do seem to be many ways that communities and areas can do this. So we've got the Rockport, Isleboro, Isleboro South Portland gigabit networks, but still 80% of people in Maine are unserved, according to the Connect ME definition of high-speed internet access, which is 10 megabits down, 10 megabits up. How are we going to reach them? How are the, what are the other ways to well, reach people? I, I think... Number one, there's no sing symbol, uh, single answer. Right. Uh, I have a good friend in Maine, Lori Lachance, who's the president of Thomas College up in Waterville, who coined the term, uh, there, there's rarely a silver bullet, but there's often silver buckshot. <laughs> Which oh, I, excellent. Uh, excellent. Isn't that yeah. wonderful? Yeah. And 
what that means to me is there are lots of solutions. Mm -hmm. So there's no single uh, answer. It may be municipal. By the way, we're going to have an exciting um, announcement later today, which I won't uh, spoil, uh, about another town in Maine that's building a, 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 the town is building a connection from our three ring binder into the town, the sort of middle mile. And we've had Rockport, South Portland, uh, some really fantastic projects. Uh, it has to be a combination. And, and we shouldn't shy away from the fact that it has to be some, sometimes publicly supported. Uh, we have a publicly supported road system. We have, uh, uh, you know, publicly uh, supported canals and docks and airports and all of that. So it, it, and the important part is this goes back a bit to history. And all you have to do is go back to the 30s and the rural electrification uh, program. At that time, electricity was available 95% in the cities of America and 50% in the rural areas. And the answer was, well, from the electric companies, well, we can't afford to run lines to all those farms. It doesn't make economic sense. Does that sound familiar? Yes. Uh, my favorite line from Mark Twain is, history doesn't always repeat itself, but it usually rhymes. Uh, and this is happening here. And so rural electrification, Franklin D. Roosevelt talked about all kinds of ways, co-ops, public support to get electricity out to rural America that changed rural America. And this to me is the same process. So there's no one answer. Um, I think municipalities have to be involved, states, federal government, private enterprise, uh, partnerships, uh, that's the way it's going to happen. We can't rely strictly, though, on the market because of the problems of, of dispersed populations. Um, and, and, it's going to, and technology is going to be different. It may be fiber in some places. It may be wireless in, in other places. It may be, uh, I, I think we're headed for a time. In fact, I had a guy in my office the other day who's in the process of raising capital for how many, Adam, 500 satellites in low Earth orbit to provide high-speed internet, uh, to skip, skip over all the wires, high-speed internet to rural areas, starting in places like Africa where they have no infrastructure at all, but also available to, to rural America. So the technology is going to be there. There are going to be a variety of technologies too, and that's the, the danger. We can't just say this is the single answer. In the 30s, FDR took on those special interests with those private electrical companies without his leadership this would not have happened, electrification in America, or yeah. not with the same speed. I think the term they used was, that man in the White House. Yes. <laughs> it was a bitter fight, and electricity became the leading domestic policy issue in the presidential elections of the day. So can you imagine high-speed Internet access having that kind of profile for national politics these days? Senator? I, I think it's close. Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think it's as more and more people realize the, the significance. And by the way, uh, Internet, the, the technology of the Internet has penetrated further and faster than any technology, radio, electricity, television, uh, and it's become more and more of a, a daily necessity. So, um, yeah, I, I, I think uh, particularly in business, it's, uh, you, you can't do business without it. If you have an area that can't get broadband, it's not going to develop economically. It just isn't. Uh, and so that is, there is going to be a demand for it, and I hope there will, that will translate into a political demand. And on the grand political scale, Mr. Edelman is part of the NEC staff, National Economic Council staff in the White House. There's awful, a lot of concern about the vanishing middle class and choices and opportunities and new forms of making a living for those people. Does this set of issues we're talking about today connect to economic opportunity there? Absolutely. I mean, you know, it, it does across the entire life cycle of being in the middle, of, of rising to and staying in the middle class, mm -hmm. right? So from the very start, having the opportunity of high-speed broadband in the classroom means that you can be in a classroom that is less segregated, that you can learn at your own pace, that you have mm -hmm. more of an opportunity to get ahead if you can get ahead and to not fall behind so that teachers in their five minutes of individualized attention know exactly where to pinpoint where you're struggling. Yeah. All the way up through getting new job skills. I mean, there are examples of you know, digital tutors yeah. that can make it incredibly fast and effective for individuals to get 
te technology job skills in particular that are one of the easiest ladders to the middle class to get that Cisco certification or the Microsoft certification that can get you a high paying job all over the country, not just in Silicon Valley, not just in Chicago or New York, but really all over because this need is all over the place. And then, you know, leading up through even small businesses, I think we've seen a major shift in the last couple of years in the economic space of what having high speed broadband can mean even for the smallest businesses. Because the ability to put your payroll online, the ability to take advantage of the efficiencies of the cloud, to store data, to not have to buy that server, to not have to buy that hard drive, can make a huge difference in the bottom line of the smallest companies. And so, you know, we absolutely see this as an economic driver. It's an economic driver, you know, obviously in the Silicon Valley sense of huge companies that are driving a lot of Wall Street growth, but, you know, even more importantly, of smaller businesses all over the country that can benefit from it. So it's core to our national economic development, and that's why, you know, in the State of the Union, just alongside, you know, roads that are repaired and effective, uh, the president said, the fastest internet. It's one of the ways that we can get ahead and stay ahead in terms of national competitiveness. I, I want to jump in because you used one word about four times in your answer, which was very appropriate, and that word is opportunity. Opportunity. And for those of you who haven't run across it, if you haven't read anything by Malcolm Gladstone, you should. Uh, and one of his books is called Outliers, and it's a study of success. And the conventional thing about success is hard work, intelligence, initiative. His, his view is that the real key is opportunity. And the, the example, one of the examples he uses is Bill Gates, who's, it was a long story, but I'll abbreviate it. Bill Gates' eighth grade class in something like 1964 in uh, up north of Seattle was the only middle school in the nation that had a computer. Mm. Because the, the moms got together and had a bake sale, and instead of buying a new basketball rim, they said, let's get one of these things called a computer. And this kid took to it. And he had the opportunity to learn this thing, and then he went on and, as a high school student, worked at the University of Washington, stealing uh, computer time to do programming. The point is, if he hadn't had that opportunity, he wouldn't have ever gone where he went. And the, the, the question is, how many kids in America would have this capacity for innovation and creativity but never had the opportunity to sit down in front of a device or sit down in front of a device connected to broadband. So that's, there's a really deep thing going on here, which is providing, and that's the secret of success of America, is access of all, of, all people from all walks of life that we bring talent forth uh, to drive the economy, and, and this is a way of allowing those people the opportunity. It's, it's just essential to the idea of who we are. David Edelman, what would you say, following up on Senator King's last remarks, to an inquisitive, curious, smart 10-year-old who came to this meeting? I know there are no 10-year-olds out here. You lost your mind. Who came to this meeting, and thank you, Senator, who came to this meeting in person because she couldn't watch the webcast, hmm. uh, but really wants to have high-speed internet access to do her homework in rural Maine. What are you going to say to that 10 year old? I think that 10 year old should go to school because I think Maine is the first state in the nation to actually meet the President's Connect Ed goal. <laughs> but, okay. well, that, yay! Congratulations on that. <laughs> really, big deal. Uh, that being said, you know, look. That, they have laptops to use. Them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which, which is even more important, exactly. You know, th this is the moment. I, I think the, the message is this is the moment that starting two years ago, the president made this challenge that the federal government has pulled out all the stops to make this happen, but it's only as good as the demand. And so, you know, I, I would send her back to talk to her parents. I would send her parents back to talk to the school administration. I would have them vote, voting matters, yeah. and, you know, elect leadership that sees this as a priority. I do think we are in a different place than we were two years ago. Two years ago, we were making the case for why broadband and digital devices in schools could possibly matter. That debate is mostly behind us, and now it's a question of getting that access and getting the opportunity. And so it won't happen automatically. The resources are there, but they have to take advantage of it. I, 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 I know we're just about out of time, but I have to add, uh, we've got a really cool program that's going on in Maine and in other, some other parts of the country. It's called Check Out the Internet. Mm. 
And the kids can go to their local library in rural areas and to check out what amounts to a, a you know, a, a, a connector device to take home to give them high-speed access. And it's to deal with this homework uh, gap. Uh, Susan Corbett is here. She's worked on it in Washington County, one of our most uh, rural areas. And in answer to your bipartisan question, uh, uh, Shelley Capito from West Virginia and I have got an amendment into the uh, education bill to take this nationwide. Oh, great. Uh, it, it's still a pilot, but it's it's a pretty cool one, and there's some uh, availability of funding for it. So that's that's the kind of thing that we have to do. It has to be, as I say, all kinds of uh, different technology options. Well, Senator, last word to you. The future belongs to those who give the next generation reason to hope. Give us here, the assembled crowd, the charge for the rest of the day. What's our job? Well, the charge is to figure out and help us figure out both policy and technology in terms of how to solve this problem. Mm -hmm. um, I think we've made a good case, and I think everybody's here because they already know what we all have been saying, how important it is, or they wouldn't be here. Uh, and by the way, I, I can't, I know that many of you are not from Maine. I wanted to welcome you to Maine uh, and tell you that this evening, no matter what time you quit, L.L. Bean is open. <laughs> uh, and you should travel to the most inappropriately named town in America, Freeport, which is just north of here. <laughs> um, so we'd love to have you here. Get out on the water. Enjoy this beautiful Maine day. But, but the, 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 the heart of this, as I said before, is opportunity. And that's the uh, opportunity and access is what's made America what it is. It's not something in the water or, or anything else. It's the fact that people, no matter where they are, um, four guys that didn't finish college can invent the the uh, personal computer business, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, that's really what we want to do. The more people that have opportunity and access to the internet and the power that it brings, the more economic activity and satisfaction and personal growth that will be available uh, to all of our people, uh, us and young people. This is a crucial moment in American history, and uh, I think we are turning the corner in a positive direction. Please join me in thanking Senator King and David Edelman for their leadership and for speaking to you today.